Hi, I'm Wendy Orr, and I want to talk to you today about my new book, Cuckoo's Flight. Cuckoo's Flight takes place about 4,000 years ago on the island of Crete in Greece. And that's a period of the Bronze Age that we call the Minoan era. And I find the Minoans fascinating because in many ways they seem very modern and sophisticated, um, beautiful art and their houses of the ruling classes had um, flushing toilets. And they may have been fairly equal in society between men and women. Women may even have been rulers, although I wonder if maybe they were religious rulers rather than war leaders. But there were many things that were very different, partly that because without modern medicine, not many people actually live to be adults or live past the age of about 35, certainly. And because they had very angry gods who were everywhere, who needed gifts or bribes of maybe just sometimes a, a beautiful song or a dance, but also physical gifts like olive oil or the first bit of a crop and sometimes even human sacrifice. Uh, that is very different to what we believe. But they were still people with the same sort of feelings that we have, the same fears, different beliefs. So they might have feared some different things, but fear was still the same. Love was still the same excitement and jealousy and all our emotions were still the same and that's what I love about writing and exploring a different world knowing that we still feel the same way. So I'm going to read you a, a couple of tiny bits to introduce you and here is just the very first little paragraph on the page of that beautiful map. If she had stayed to load the kiln as she should have, she'd never have seen the ship. Mama said the ship still would have been there, so everything had to happen the way it did. But that's not true. Cleo saw it, and the world changed. And skipping ahead to partly why the world changed. Gray girl, misty as the morning sea, dappled like a pebbled beach, her heart beating with Cleo's since they were raised girl and foal on the milk of the mare when Cleo's mother had none. Dada tells of lifting a babe too young to stand to the foal's back so they could learn each other's warmth. And by the time they were two, they moved as one. Mama always afraid, seeing that horses wild as stags in the hills had no place in their lives, but couldn't forbid because Dada's God say, they're the heart of his. Cleo wishes the goddess would say the same for her, but the great mother stays silent, except in a link she forged between horse and girl, so that even that day, when a snake wriggled out from a rock through the mare's front legs, so she shied and reared, throwing Cleo hard to her knees, pain spearing into her hips so fierce she thought she would die, her mind closing in darkness. Gray girl, wouldn't let her drown in that dark, wouldn't leave her side, standing guard on the path, trumpeting a neigh of terror till Petros the herder came, and then Dada, running all the way from town and carrying Cleo home as if she were a babe. She remembered the gray girl's call and seeing Dada's face drained to the color of ash, but nothing of the moon that followed till she heard Mama weeping. Three daughters I've lost so far, can the great mother not leave me one? And her grandmother's voice, calm and sure, the girl will live. Her life will not be the one we planned, but when life changes, so must we. And she is strong enough to do that. So let me share my screen and show you some of the things that I learned and decided in writing this book and there's the cover and here are the covers of Swallows Dance and Dragonfly Song, the other two books in this world. 
And when I was researching Swallows Dance, I was lucky enough to go to Crete and spend some time with an archaeologist who had excavated in Gornia, which is somewhere in, in there. And you can see that the hills are still very wild and rocky and probably not so different to how they were 4,000 years ago. And here's the land around Gornia. There might've been um, some more trees, but they weren't big trees here. The, round, the ground is too rocky. And here are walls of one of the buildings. And this whole town is the bottom walls made of rock are still there. And here's the road that went around the outside, probably an outside wall. And it is so exciting to actually walk on that road and to imagine that you are walking on these rocks that somebody laid down, real people laid them down 4,000 years ago. That, um, Dr. Sabina Beckman, the archeologist said, may be an altar stone that could be a hole for draining blood. And she said, or perhaps it's an anchor stone that had been brought up here. But certainly there are several altar stones and more buildings. You see these round rocks of the region and then probably mud clay bricks would have been the top walls. Um, except for the palace, which was all built of giant rocks and a hill, which I decided to call Lookout Hill. And you can imagine seeing some of the moon rise between those hills. And this is the floor of the Potter's Studio. And I find it incredible that they know what all these different buildings were, but this one, when you move all the rock away, there is still soft powdered clay on the floor. And that seemed magical to me. And I started to think that my family might become potters. And then two days later, I was hiking down um, a sacred mountain and I picked up this piece of pot on the path from about 1600 BCE. And I showed it to the archeologist and Sabina, I said, look, you know, I think I can see writing on it. There's the Minoan hieroglyphics. And she said, no, those are scratches from going down a hill for 4,000 years. She said, but there is a thumbprint. And I put my thumb on it and I felt it as if I was digging into soft, clay making a thumbprint and I had goosebumps every time I think of that. This is an imitation Minoan house that, that Sabina the archaeologist built um, with mud clay bricks and a roof that people might have slept on and they might have had a second story too. When I first heard about boar's tusk helmets, I pictured that they would be like boar's tusks sticking out like a Viking helmet, but they are split and stuck onto a clay, uh, sorry, a leather cap. So they're very hard and would protect you if somebody tried to spear you or stab you um, in the head. And these are giant pots, as you can see, they're big part of an own society because they uh, stored all sorts of things in them. They look, of course, as if they ought to have Alibaba hiding from the 40 thieves in them. And you certainly could. You can see they are quite a lot taller than I am. The double axes were possibly just ceremonial, but I wonder if at some stages they might have been used in war too. But Every book, as well as research, pulls something from the author. And so I decided that just as horses had been very important to me when I was a child and teenager, they were important to my character, Cleo. And so I did a 
bit more research. And this is a little statue that I saw in a museum in um, just outside Knossos, the palace in Crete. And this is a goddess sitting on a little horse. Now, if you have a statue of a goddess sitting on a horse, it means horses were important in society. We don't think so much of horses with the Manolans because they were very good at, um, at acrobatics over the backs of bulls, and that's what we think of. But I started to think, right, my character Cleo is trying to encourage people to use horses more, and she would rather just be with her horses instead of being a potter like the rest of her family. So I wrote it and wrote it and it wasn't really coming to life. This book took a bit longer than some of mine. It was about two and a half years in the writing. And then while it was not really going very well, my sister went on a riding trip in Mongolia and I thought, what an absolutely fabulous thing to do. I would have just loved to do something like that. But Quite a few years ago, I broke my neck and quite a few other bones and things, and I can't ride anymore. Um, I can walk and you can see I've learned to stand up and balance there, but I can't ride. And I started thinking about that and I realized that my, my character Cleo was also disabled and could not ride. And so then the book started to come to life because the important thing became, how does she see herself now if she can't ride? And riding is so important to her. Because as the grandmother says, when life changes, so must we. And over the last nearly two years, pretty well everyone in the world has learned that we have to change sometimes when life changes around us, even without something like breaking your neck. And so to me, the magic in a story, as well as getting to live another life, it gives us another way to kind of look at, well, how can we change things? Who can we be? But because I like reading about adventure, there's always an awful lot of adventure in finding that. That's just a little thread through the story. And so I'm going to read you a last little segment um, later on in the story from the chapter called Pirates about Cleo's father, Hector. Hector is at the tiller, steering the swallow painted ship out of a great trading port. Dulos is resting in the small cabin after last night's celebrations. Ahead of them, their sister ship has already hoisted her big square sail. But as they clear the shelter of the port and Hector calls for the oars to be shipped, he dreams of pushing the steering paddle farther around and ordering the sailors to keep on rowing toward home. Five more days till the full moon of the spring festival. He would give up all the world's bronze for the chance to see his daughter before then to ignore the lady, the oracle, and the gods themselves to rescue her, fleeing across the island in the chariot he built with such love and care. He can't, he doesn't. It's a dream that never leaves him, but with each day it's less relevant. He doesn't know if they could possibly make it now. No one sails against the winds to go that way around the trading route. Suddenly he sees it. An eye blink before the lookout in the bow shouts the warning. A, a sleek, black-hulled raider ship, pirates. They've come out from behind a rocky islet. Their sail is up, filled and fast with a strong north wind. Row, shouts Hector, into the lee of the island. The islet's steep cliffs will block the wind. The pirate's sail will be no use. They'll both have to depend on their oars. The men pull hard, but the ship is heavy. The pirates have time to pick up their own oars and chase them. Dulos staggers out from the cabin, rubbing his eyes as Hector shouts, Port, now! The rowers lift their starboard oars out of the water, haul hard on the port and turn the ship toward the shelter of the island. The pirates do the same. 
the long, sharp snout of the pirate boat rams the swallow-painted ship. Dulos staggers and falls. Rowers tumble from benches. Hector shoves the tiller with all his strength, but the steering paddle doesn't move. The ship is hard against the rocky cliffs of the little island. Water is pouring through the hole in the side. Cheering wildly, the pirates pull out daggers. Before they have even loosened their sail, the first rowers are scrambling over their bow to leap onto the swallow ship's deck. Hector reaches for his dagger. Fight, men, he shouts, running down the center bridge to haul his brother-in-law to his feet. Dulos is staggering, a trickle of blood running down his forehead, but he waves his dagger fiercely. A gust of wind, a whirling whim of the god of the sea, fills the pirate sail. Well, if you want to know what else happens, you'll have to read the book. And if you do, I really hope you'll enjoy it. Thanks.